But welcome. It's the Black Belt track. Uh, today, these two gentlemen will be talking about Windows container security. Suran. Is that yep. Right? Thank you. Good. Yuvraj. Yuvraj. Damn. I practiced those two. <laughs> two great gentlemen here. Please help me uh, welcome them to give their talk. Awesome. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope everybody is enjoying the conference so far. And uh, we're all pumped up and energized after lunch. Um, I am. I just had the Oasis grill shawarma thing uh, uh, right across the street. That thing is really good, by the way. So if you haven't tried it, you definitely should. Um, cool. So uh, my name is Yuvraj Mehta. Um, and Sarhan? I'm Sarhan. I uh, work on the uh, Microsoft security team. Um, I do product management at Docker um, and um, been focused on security um, since the beginning of this year. Um, been with Docker since uh, last August. Um, so today, um, we have a full agenda um, for you guys. Um, so we're going to talk about, uh, largely about Windows containers and Windows container security. Um, we took an approach where we want to start off with giving you a high-level picture and then drill down more and more uh, into the details. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, the Docker EE architecture um, and uh, how Docker EE helps you secure your software supply chain, and then how Docker EE also provides uh, you know, uh, security once your containers are deployed in production. Um, and then Sarhan will cover um, all the nitty-gritty details about Windows containers, the Windows containers architecture, um, process isolation, Hyper-V isolation, Windows internals. We're, co we're going to cover be security best practices, uh, kind of like summarizing it up. And then we have some really interesting uh, propositions in terms of you know, Microsoft security approaches. So with that in mind, uh, let's get started. So uh, if you have not seen this, uh, seen this picture uh, yet, uh, you probably will uh, in the multiple breakout sessions or discussions you will have with, uh, with Docker architects and, and your Docker pals. Um, so um, the, the Docker uh, Enterprise Edition platform uh, provides an end-to-end -end, you know, uh, uh, container, uh, container deployment uh, journey. And security is, integral, is an integral part of that, uh, of that platform. And as you saw today in the keynote, you know, security is one of the key pillars um, of how Docker approaches product and, and how Docker approaches its own culture as well. Um, so as part of uh, Docker EE, one of the core security capabilities is that we want to build in security into the... Uh, into the software supply chain. So with Docker EE, um, you can, uh, number one, you get security at the developer machine with Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows. Um, you can create, uh, create the Docker image, um, check it into a Docker trusted registry. Um, that res uh, the Docker trusted registry comes with scanning capabilities. So you can scan for vulnerabilities for both Windows containers and for Linux containers as well. Um, the vulnerabilities uh, go down to the binary level uh, to show you, you know, which CVEs uh, currently exist in that uh, in that particular image, and also apply promotion policies to uh, to those container images as well. Um, Next, uh, those same uh, security policies can be applied to multiple DTRs. So if you have, uh, if you, you can replicate your DTR um, you know, content from uh, one geolocation to another, um, and we call that DTR mirroring. Um, so uh, your security policies kind of follow the geolocation where your registry is located. Uh, lastly, once you get to deploying containers in production through DTR, um, UCP itself provides you security capabilities through RBAC as well. Um, and uh, most likely later this year, we will also be providing more integrations between DTR and UCP by surfacing the vulnerability data into UCP as well, so that you know if you have a container deployed in production, whether there are any vulnerabilities that exist in that particular image as well. Now, Docker E is the only platform that provides this for both Windows and for Linux containers. Um, 
So once you have your containers deployed in production, you want to make sure that only the concerned folks, concerned parties, have access to the right, is the right set of infrastructure and the right set of images. That's where secure application zones within UCP come into play, where you know your particular dev team, let's say if it's a .NET dev team, and they're using Swarm uh, in order to uh, deploy container workloads uh, or Windows container workloads, only they have access to the Windows worker nodes, and those worker nodes can be Windows Server 2016, and um, in a couple of months, uh, or within a quarter, we will also have support for 1709, Windows Server 1709, Windows Server 1803 as well. Um, and also, as you move, uh, um, as you move your deployment from de from development to test to production, you can pick and choose, and you can apply the correct RBAC policies uh, for which team has access to which particular uh, particular piece of infrastructure. Um, so, secure application zones come with uh, come with UCP. So now. You know, what we just went through is how you take, uh, uh, how Docker E helps you secure an image as you're creating it, uh, as you create the image on the developer desktop, how it would move through a, uh, uh, through a secure supply chain, and then how Docker E secures it once you do deploy it in production. All right, so now you deploy the image in production, uh, the container, and it's a Windows container, and it's running, let's say, on a Windows server, let's say 2016. Um, how, what, what is happening when that container is running? Um, what have we done with my, in collaboration with Microsoft to make, uh, make Windows containers a reality uh, and bring it to market? So next section, I'm gonna hand it over to Sarhan to cover. Awesome, thank you. All right, so once again, here's another diagram that you've probably seen a bunch of times before. Um, this is kind of you know, the generic operating system agnostic-ish view of how a container is deployed on a, a specific host. And this is the Windows version of that. It's pretty much the same thing. The major difference here is that we provide a system service called the host compute service, and another one for networking called the host networking service uh, that Docker will call into to do the final action of launching an instantial container on the host. Uh, now, we've already had a great talk last year about uh, the host network service, so I'm going to keep my talk mainly about the compute side of things and how we actually execute on that. So let's move on to a generic block diagram. We, you've probably seen this in many of the Microsoft marketing materials, and we, we do love this diagram a lot. Um, but it does present us with a very like easy, high-level way of uh, seeing what a container looks like from a uh, operating system perspective. It is a separate user space that has been namespaced in some way, shape, or form, that has its own uh, process tree with all the requisite system processes running along with whatever target application you requested. Uh, we also provide Hyper-V isolation as an option for uh, Windows Server containers so that you can not only use containers as a um, isolation boundary but also as a security boundary. So that increases the, uh, the, the limitation from the security standpoint. It makes it difficult for attackers to break out since you no longer even share the same kernel. But the usage, in, uh, uh, the usage and the view from the container side is identical to a normal Windows Server container. Now, let's first discuss how we did the kernel isolation in Windows. Um, you guys are probably familiar with a lot of the terms on the left side uh, related to Linux namespaces, C groups, seccomp. And in large part, some of these concepts apply directly to Windows with different names, with different kinds of approaches to tac tackling that problem, but effectively the same. Um, there are two of these that are wildly different, and I'll talk about those soon. But let's t talk about silos and job objects, our equivalent of namespaces and C groups. So silos was a concept that didn't exist in Windows prior to Windows Server 2016. Uh, this is essentially our idea of namespacing. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with the Windows NT uh, operating system, the architecture that underlies all of Windows since 1993. But it is all based on a large lookup table of objects in the kernel that represent everything from the processes, the threads, the uh, IPC mechanisms like uh, 
name pipes and RPC, ALPC ports. All of these are represented in the kernel as objects, and all of them are referenced in a large object table. We have a massive manager that does all the work to make sure you know, in, uh, a process that has a handle to the object, actually the object still exists, and all the other you know, uh, basic operations there. But for uh, namespacing, we realized that all we, we, could, we needed to do was essentially take that object table, create a new one, a clean one, and isolate it from, uh, isolate certain processes to only read or see things in that object table. And that's essentially what silos are, is a separate object table that you can assign a tree of processes that will have their own file system, their own process tree, their own everything. So it's great. It kind of fell, on our, uh, fell in front of us really easily. And we also had something uh, in Windows since uh, Windows 2000 called job objects, which produced actually a lot of the same functionality that C groups provides. So that's, um, there are a lot of restrictions that you can apply to a parent uh, process and its children, including CPU, memory, and I.O. limitations. There's a bunch of other stuff that we don't care about, but the main ones that job uh, objects provides, we can leverage by instead of assigning it to a specific process and its children, we can assign it to an entire silo as a non-negotiable action. The process can no longer opt out of it. And that gives us the ability to restrict an entire silo to whatever uh, co container constraints we want. Now, I'll go into more detail about how exactly that plays in with the Docker CLI and how you can assign those restrictions. But um, let's first talk about the things that are completely different from Linux. Um, one thing about Windows that is different from Linux, and I don't want to start any sort of, you know, graybeard architectural fight. I was not alive when those discussions were uh, going on. Um, is the fact that Windows kind of likes to provide services using other user mode applications. So, um, some of you are probably familiar with system crashes and things like CSRSS.exe, LSASS.exe. These are major system of processes. If you kill, your entire box will go down in flames. Um, th those uh, services must be alive and running in not just the root uh, namespace, but also the new container namespaces that we create. And they need to be providing services for your applications that you deploy inside the container. Um, this makes syscall filtering very different um, than in Linux because we no longer have the luxury of saying you cannot access this list and it's going to apply to the entire container. Instead, we can only provide a per process uh, syscall limitation that excludes these system processes and services that are running in your container but do apply to applications that you are running. Um, for example, uh, servers or services that are deployed by your side of things. Now, the issue there is, of course, that that requires more development work on your side, but we think that the, uh, the benefits of providing that kind of kernel isolation is important for scenarios where you are receiving um, data and parsing data from untrusted sources. Um, most of those limitations uh, for syscalls are around the graphics subsystem in Windows. We basically just kind of can block off um, certain swaths or the entirety of the Win32K uh, syscall um, interface. And it provides a good amount of security from the kernel perspective. But the, if the process can still access a myriad of different services and files inside your container, they can still do a lot of damage. And that's where sandboxing comes in. And we have an existing sandboxing um, technology that we use for our application platform, the universal Windows platform. The stuff that you see in the Microsoft Store is more or less mostly uh, UWPs. And this is very similar to mobile application um, capability-based RBAC. You, can, you basically start off with a very limited set of accesses. You don't have access to anything other than some executable files in the system folder. You don't have uh, networking. You don't have sound. You don't have et cetera. Uh, you can use this even as a non-UWP application to enhance or contain certain processes that you, uh, you create yourself. So it's very common in, it, at Microsoft and Windows today to take parsing or untrusted data um, 
sorry, untrusted data parsing applications and shoot, uh, create an offshoot app container process to do the actual work and then come back and use that information afterwards and basically allow for like this kind of entry point to, uh, that prevents attackers from being able to escalate further. Again, this is another, this is a pretty dev heavy ask from, from our side to tell you guys to do. And we are working to make these APIs easier to use from a developer standpoint so that more people can take advantage of them and their services. Now, um, next up is the file system. So we've talked about, you know, a separate object namespace that we've provided to a container. But we haven't really talked about what that means for the file system aspect. Like, what is their root folder? What is the, how do they start booting? And for that, we actually had to build the container uh, file system filter. We didn't have a union file system before Windows Server 2016 that would allow us to take a number of folders with special reparse tags that say, hey, I actually am a child of this specific parent layer. So if you don't see anything, if I don't have any data for this file, just go to that guy and he, he'll have it. Um, and in addition to that kind of reparse action, the file system filter also creates a UnionFS that merges in a read-write layer at the top, which we do as a mounted VHD, so that any changes that the container makes to the file system are applied to that VHD rather than to those uh, container layers themselves. Now let's walk through the actual action of creating a container. Um, this looks pretty much like any other scenario where someone has either a client running on the same system or remotely requesting the creation of a new container. The first thing the Docker engine will do is make a call down to the host compute service with basically a laundry list configuration of what exactly it wants from this container. So it'll say, I've already extracted the image here and this is the image I want to base this new container off of, and here are the restrictions I'd want to apply. The host compute service will create a new job object with those restrictions in mind, um, create a new sandbox VHD for you, and create a silo that is based off of that file system filtered view of both that VHD and the container image you marked in. And the next thing it does is call win in it, and wham, you get a new empty process tree with all the processes you need to get a container running. With the exception of one uh, service, all of these are the existing standard Windows services that you'd expect if you booted Windows today in Windows Server Core or Nano Server. That one process is the C exec service, which is the only process by default that can communicate between uh, partitions in Windows, and we use that to pass an, the exec command for the entry point you actually want to run inside the container and we launch the process you requested. Um, optionally, we will also provide standard I.O. ports um, to be passed between uh, the container and Docker so that you can then interact with the container yourself. So a really easy way or like a better way to think about this stuff is by actually looking at what it looks like from Process Explorer or Task Manager. This way you can see the actual tree that's being created for you when you create a new container. That includes, like I said, CSRSS, WinInit, LSA. It also includes these services running inside service host, and finally, CXEC service, who will be calling your new uh, application. So this is what every single container looks like on the inside. Um, that's also true for Hyper-V isolation. It's just that that container now rests inside someone else's OS, someone, it's a, a kernel from far, far away from you. And we actually implemented, while it does say just Hyper-V VM, it's not really fair to just call it any other Hyper-V VM. We worked really hard to pre, uh, introduce the scalability and security of a Hyper-V VM along with the um, interactions of a container to this VM. And, and there's a lot of technologies that we introduced to make this happen in a safe way and to maintain our security boundary that we promised with Hyper-V while still being able to run many, many, many containers on one host and be able to share uh, uh, host data in an effective way. So let's start with the, the main core difference between um, a Hyper-V isolated container and a standard Hyper-V VM. And that is the way we allocate memory for the container. Uh, traditionally, Hyper-V VMs will 
actually receive their memory directly from the hypervisor. A call is made from the root to the hypervisor requesting a new partition to be created of n gigabytes, and that RAM is pulled directly from your physical address space and given to that container or VM. In the case of Hyper-V isolated containers, we do not actually call the hypervisor at all. And in fact, we create a partition that references memory that's virtually allocated and controlled by the host. For each VM that we uh, run, for each Hyper-V isolated VM, we actually create a VM mem process that has no threads and only contains an allocation that represents your system memory for the guest. This is super powerful because it allows us to clone at the drop of a hat. Um, it allows the host to peer into that memory and determine if there's any duplicate uh, zeros or ones pages that it can just map out to the same area. So it reduces the amount of memory load we have. Um, and it actually does one more cool thing, but I'll get to that in a minute. The other thing that I want to talk about was the management architecture that we talked about earlier with uh, Windows Server containers. It works exactly the same way uh, in Hyper-V isolated containers. And that's a question we get asked a lot, like what is missing or like what's different? Uh, what can't I do? And the answer is really almost everything maps directly. All the interactions you do in a Windows Server container works almost entirely the same way on a Hyper-V isolated Windows Server container. There are some exceptions to resource constraints, and then we'll get to those in a minute, but this, uh, the management architecture works identically, with the exception that in, um, we now have a guest compute service that talks to the host compute service. And its job is to basically ferry the C exec commands that we talked about earlier to the inside of the container. Now, let's talk about storage, because that's one of the major changes that we had to make um, for Hyper-V uh, isolated containers to work out. So Hyper-V is powerful, strong, and fast, but it's not very flexible when it comes to storage. We provide the op option of mounting VHDs to a container, or sorry, a VM, and that's about it. So for containers to come to life, we needed to be able to dynamically add uh, layers, uh, container layers to a VM knowing full well that another VM could start up or another normal container could start up at the same time needing those same files. So we introduced VSMB server, which is essentially an SMB server that communicates over our Hyper-V IPC mechanism, VM bus, to the host and makes SMB requests requesting files to be pa uh, passed back to it. And that's how we share all the container layers. We don't do any parsing of the layers themselves on the host. We may, uh, limit that action so that all of the filter driver and the union FS work is done inside the guest kernel. And we simply map the many layers that your image is dependent on. And a, separately, we uh, connect a empty VHD. And then the, the guest kernel takes care of the rest to actually build the same image inside the container and make it look as if it's identical. A VSMB server is a really, really cool technology that we've uh, d done our very best to secure. Since it's, it's, uh, when it comes to storage, access is important. And we don't want to elevate privilege by accidentally providing too much privilege to the VSMB server, allowing it to read files it's not supposed to read in the host. Um, but at the same time, we expect the host to be able to read files at the system privilege level just so that we can pass in all the information your container needs. So with that in mind, we, we took tackled this high-risk environment by, one, placing it in the user mode of the host instead of the kernel mode, mm -hmm. and two, by instead of passing access directly to the VM worker process and saying, you know what, you're the server, you can handle this, we gated it with the VM compute service that we've talked about before, the host compute service. Um, the host compute service knows your configuration. It receives it from Docker. It knows which folders it needs to map in for your container to run. It will create the, uh, it will call create file on the host folder and actually pass just the handle over to the VSMB server. The handle is then used in addition to a relative file path so that any uh, VSMB accesses are maintained and contained in this sandbox and they can only read those files. By default, the VSMB server running inside the context of the VM worker process has no access to any system files or any container images. 
And uh, shared volumes works kind of the same way as uh, the other container layer images work, with the exception that it's read-write. Oops, sorry. I'll go back to that, just so those taking pictures can grab a picture. These slides are going to be up online, in case you guys are worried. <laughs> now, direct map files are a really cool technology that we only were able to do because we converged both the VSMB server tech that we built and the fact that we now have a kind of a guest physical address range that we can manipulate and map parts into from the host. So when VSMB server receives a request from the guest uh, that is an executable image it wants to load in, instead of doing a lot of work piping in packet by packet uh, from the host to the guest the file, we instead map the file into a, an extension of the physical address range of the guest directly. That means the host handles the actual file uh, loading itself. If any page faults occur, the host will bring it up and put it back into the physical memory so that the guest VM can read it. But it also means that the, the host only needs to load that image once, that file once. And every single container running on your system, both kernel isolated and Hyper-V isolated, can leverage that file being loaded into memory without any excess uh, memory usage. And we think that's really powerful from a uh, you know, scaling uh, perspective, but it's also really great for security as well, since we no longer have to deal with large, complicated uh, message protocols to pass anything in. Now let's talk about the resource limitations uh, that you can apply to a Windows container and how they sort of work differently, but pretty close in both uh, kernel isolation or process isolation and uh, Hyper-V isolation. So the first one's memory. It's pretty, pretty obvious what this does. You limit the amount of memory your container has access to. In the case of kernel isolation, that means effectively uh, tagging the job object for your silo with a certain limit. And that limit will now apply to all memory allocations in, in your container, including the system services that we talked about before. And it includes any um, memory allocated on your behalf, on your process's behalf, by the, system, the kernel. It does exclude any kernel-side memory allocations that may have been made during uh, interactions with, with the uh, container, but those are relatively minor. On the Hyper-V isolation side of things, VM memory. We already have that concept. We just give you that block of memory for your uh, container. The only exception here is that the Hyper-V devices themselves, the services that are provided on the host to get your Hyper-V machine up and running, those are exempted from this memory limitation. Compute and CPU cycles are worked relatively the same way as you'd expect them to in Linux. Um, the job object itself has the ability to do both a hard cap on how much CPU time you can get and also a weight that you can apply. And the uh, NT scheduler will work with the weight you've provided to ensure that your processes in that silo are prioritized accordingly, either lower or higher than other uh, processes on your system. Um, the Hyper-V uh, side of things, you can assign um, CPUs based on how many CPUs you are, have uh, on your host but you can also provide a weight and the hypervisor scheduler will adjust the amount of time your virtual CPUs receive based on the weight you provided in Docker. IO works uh, actually almost identically between um, kernel isolation and Hyper-V isolation. We have a job object that uh, provides rate limiting for bandwidth and uh, IO operations and they apply to everything running inside your silo, but they also apply to the aforementioned uh, VM worker process, which provides services to your, um, to your guest VM. So that would apply to, for example, VSMB server that we talked about before. And finally, we have one storage option. It's called size, and it just limits the size of your sandbox uh, VHD. It works exactly the same way because we pass VHDs in the same way between uh, kernel and Hyper-V isolation. One of them is just mounted back to the host, and the other one is mounted to the guest. Now, 
I've talked a lot about security boundaries, but what, what that actually means from my side of things and my team mm -hmm. is that we make, an, we make a promise that says we are committed to securing the guest to host boundary between the Hyper-V uh, VM that hosts that container and the host itself. And what that has meant for, from my perspective in my day-to-day -day life is that I have spent, uh, with, along with my team, a lot of time discussing new feature changes in design with the John Starks of uh, the Hyper-V developer land. But then, in addition, reviewing any code that parses untrusted data between guest and host and if the pr protocol calls for it, for example, with VSMB, even creating a large fuzzer that can run at scale to find as many issues in both the parsing and the state machine on these systems. So we make a very high security promise here, and we, we try to do uh, our very best in finding issues. Of course, uh, there's no, never a shortage of bugs in high complex uh, software products. And for that reason, we actually have uh, and ask for the external community to find bugs for us. And we will pay them a lot of money, up to $250,000 for an issue that leads to code execution in the host uh, through the Hyper-V bounty. Uh, and it is, it is a large promise uh, from, for us that we want to ensure that we can get the best and the highest quality software here and protect uh, our customers running both Hyper-V uh, VMs themselves, and also uh, containers with Hyper-V isolation. And finally, I want to close this out with the best practices that we want to kind of give to the community so that we're all on the same page with what we think is, is the right thing to do when deploying containers at scale to the public. And it always starts at the, the smallest and closest part of the onion, which is the container itself. Um, you need, uh, regardless of what isolation you provide, it's of utmost importance to have the, the contents of the container itself rock solid. So that includes things like image signing and scanning that you can uh, use through Docker E. Or, or, and in addition to that, find, uh, set up automated builds so that th the amount of work being done to update your uh, container image should be minimal. It should be very quick for you as a owner of a service to update to the latest version of both the OS and any of the uh, layers that you depend on underneath. And finally, we do want you guys to think about process isolation and restriction. Think about sandboxing things that you think are really unsafe. If you're worried about uh, parsing data from the internet, if you're providing a web service directly, or if you are uh, receiving data that has not been vetted yet in the prior like uh, front end of your service, these are things that need to be scrutinized, both from a security code review perspective, but also in terms of isolation and defense in depth. Um, in addition, if you are worried about these kinds of scenarios, or if you have a regulatory requirement, we highly suggest you try out Hyper-V isolation. We think it's like best in class uh, security boundary for containers for Windows. And it's really, really strong. And we think that will give you the peace of mind when you're maintaining a network architecture with container hosting that the hosts themselves have not been compromised. But of course, uh, we also suggest using uh, the technology available to you, especially uh, Docker E secrets, to instead of mapping, for example, shared volumes between um, containers, use the secrets API to pass them securely without, with minimi by minimizing the risk on both the host and the containers themselves and the, and the credentials themselves. And finally, none of this matters if you provide containers with a network access that goes well beyond what they need. If you don't need to compromise the host to get at what you need from, uh, as an attacker, they'll take that route. They will always find the cheapest and easiest route to the uh, sensitive information or credentials that they want, ultimately. So network isolation is a fundamental requirement for any sort of hosting. And we think by taking on all three of these layers together, um, you have a good chance of building a secure uh, container infrastructure.
And I think with that, we're done. Yep, we'll open up for questions. Okay. <laughs> um, I think Peter is coming around. Yep. Thank you. Can you describe what you mean by image scanning? Sure. Um, so image scanning is basically uh, the um, capability to, uh, to scan a container image uh, when it is in a, uh, when it's in a container registry for any known vulnerabilities, any CVEs um, that could exist in that particular container image when that image was created. Yeah, so uh, uh, Docker uh, Trusted Registry comes with its own um, you know, uh, image scanning solution. Um, but there are also other, uh, you know, uh, image scanning capabilities uh, that currently uh, are available from the ecosystem as well, and also open source. Uh, hi, question about the uh, uh, the NT silos. Um, in you described it as starting off with an empty, um, an empty NT object table. So in the Linux namespaces, there are different namespaces, and you can do interesting things by mm -hmm. maybe having participating in the same network namespace but different mount namespaces, does, do silos provide the same flexibility or is it kind of an all or nothing? Like does it set and isolate network, processes, IPC, all that stuff? It is more or less all, of, all or nothing right now. Um, did everyone catch the question? All right, cool. But yeah, it, it's more or less a very strict kind of restriction that's built specifically for containers. It, uh, I think we are looking into making silos a little more flexible for other uses, but right now it's mainly to support the container scenario. That's a good question. I'm wanting to know a little bit more exactly how does the domain model, which has been around for a long time, how does that fit into this? Because with the underlying system, with the Docker, I would want a blast zone of that container so that if they take that over, so that means that apparently I'm still going to have to have some LDAP connectivity, still have to have that. So is the container itself going to be part of the domain? Is the container itself going to be separate? Because yep. I was really surprised we had a lot of conversation in this about inside the actual container, but if it just runs, who cares? It's, uh, people on the outside have to con connect to it. Sure. Yeah, so uh, no, you, uh, I mean, jo joining a particular container to the domain, that's, um, that capability currently does not exist, right? So you're not, so you're not joining a container to a, uh, to a domain. However, what Microsoft has made available, and it's existed since, I think, 2012, 2012 R2, and Taylor can keep me honest here, is something called GMSA, or Group Managed Service, uh, service Accounts. So for the services that are running inside the container, uh, you can pass those service accounts into the container when it start, uh, uh, when it starts up. And uh, sorry, go, seems like you have another question. Yeah, so, so to that point, then, hey, for, ten years ago, Microsoft had a whole system The, the host is still on domain. Right. The, the well, host is still GMSA on the domain. that you pass into the container. So that credential itself, yes. At that point, you can use that credential. A container can use that, GM, that virtual oh. service uh, account to, make, uh, to do operations on your network. Your network should be resilient against that service account being compromised. But that is our kind of the, the boundary that we're working on. All right, that's about our time. Sure. Uh, we haven't you. spoke, but I'm sure you guys will be out in the hall uh, that they can answer more questions. If not, yep. uh, there's other experts around. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you.